And in the, in the workshops, um, you know, for me, the reality of being here is really working, having worked with these extraordinary artists the last couple of days. And the images of, of powerful spaces of childhood, of memory, of um, deep injustices identified is really, really important to me um, in, in creating performance. Um, and I want to just dive into a little piece that sort of addresses that. And in some ways, for the workshop folks, most of whom are here, um, in some ways, this piece would be my answer to the structure we did yesterday, um, which I kind of wanted to place some things with that. Um, I don't think I need to tell you anything about this, that, except I'm nine years old in the piece, and uh, that's it. Okay, we'll dive in. All right, I'm nine, all right? I'm walking to school with my best friend, Scott Milhouse, who is also nine. Now, Scott is the second cousin of the President of the United States of America. So as you will all quickly see, Republicans have been fucking with me for as long as I can remember. <laughs> all right, Scott Milhouse is the second cousin of President Richard Milhouse Nixon, and we're growing up in Nixon's hometown of Whittier, California. And it's somewhere in the second term before he resigns in disgrace, having almost toppled our republic. All right, now we're walking to school, two nine-year-old young Republican boys on our way to Macy Elementary in La Havre. Now we're free associating, as nine-year-old boys will, commenting on everything we see as we walk our way to school. And we're walking by what is widely regarded as the most tastefully decorated house in our suburban neighborhood. <laughs> Much admired for its truly awesome, impressive series of 47 ceramic gardenelles <laughs> decorating the winding path to the front door. Well, Scott gestures wide to this symphony, this Wagner opera of ceramic garden elves. And he says, you know, Tim, when I grow up, you know, I'm going to marry that cute girl in our class, Gail Gardner. Yep, yep, yep. I'm going to marry her, and we're going to live together forever in the house of ceramic garden elves. <laughs> then he gives this shit-eating grin. This is it. Like, he thinks he's going to deserve a 99 and a happy face on the plot quiz we're going to have later that day about the injustice of heterosexual privilege. <laughs> now, I like my time. Scott and I have never discussed marriage before. From my point of view, I have always assumed that Scott and I will marry each other <laughs> and live in the house of Sammy Guard down. It was a natural assumption for a little boy to make, but I knew I maybe didn't have the rules of this game quite down, much like football. So, <laughs> I bided my time by banging my lost in space lunchbox against my <laughs> My lost in space lunchbox filled with my favorite lunch of my ninth year. Yes, there it is. Wonder Bread, white boy Protestant sandwich, yeah. Oh, Jib Smooth peanut butter, Welch's grape jelly. Customized by my mom with a sort of Latino flair she saw on TV. Two fistfuls of Fritos corn chips crushed under the Welch's grape jelly. <laughs> really good. <laughs> Salt, fat, oil, sugar, everything Americans need to grow strong and develop early onset diabetes. <laughs> and here next to the thermos is a special treat, a sacred treat, a Twinkie <laughs> in its crisp, confident silly. <laughs> All right, I know I'm making a huge mistake before I even open my mouth, but I can't help myself. Truth will rise from the center of the earth through our bodies. And I say to him, but Scott, wait, you can't marry Gil Gardner. When I grow up, I want to marry you and live in the house of Trammy Gardenhouse. I actually said this to him. Scott said, what, Tim, are you crazy? Boys can't marry other boys. Listen, I never heard such nonsense. Why? He goes, because. I go, why? He goes, because. I go, because. Why? <laughs> Clearly, logic is not going to work with a pea brain like his, right? <laughs> so he gets really mad that I'm challenging him. And so he, he shoves me really hard, and I fall head over heels into the deep ivy of our United Church of Christ minister's front yard. <laughs> we all knew that rats lurked and prospered there in that gnarly United Church of Christ labyrinth. <laughs> And he called on me, why was he so bad? I just asked him to marry me. He said, you take it back. Never say that again. You take it back. Say you want to marry me. Let the house run my house. I want to get back. You take it back. Or I'm going to give you an Indian bird. And he grabs the skin on my wrist and twists it painfully in opposite directions. Doesn't he know how politically incorrect that term is? You take it back. Or take it back. Indian bird to the other wrist. Okay. <laughs> Probably I could have fought him off, right? I mean, I actually wasn't that much of a wuss. I was bigger than him. But I have to admit. Some part of me had been longing for physical closeness. 
ever since kindergarten. <laughs> Being tortured physically by him was simply going to have to do. <laughs> Some of you over here have been in this relationship. I just said that. <laughs> well, the strength of the blow is strong. Flung my lunchbox wide open, and he sees that Twinkie, and a horrible thought occurs to him. He says, you take it back, Tim, or I'm going to jam this Twinkie in your throat and kill you. And I say to him, no, I won't take it back. The strength of my little nine-year-old queer voice surprises even me. When I grow up, Scott, I'm going to marry you whether you like it or not. We're going to live together forever in the house, forever in the house. <laughs> well, it looked like bad weather passes over his face. He grabs that Twinkie, stuffs it in my mouth, puts both hands over my face. My entire being explodes in silicone and Twinkie goo. <laughs> I know, little boys, gay or not, are not supposed to suck on silicone ever, the dry cleaners and all that. You know, I, I know I'm going to have to take it back, OK? But fortunately, just the week before, my oldest brother Fred, much older than me, who was a, a college student at UC Berkeley, he taught me something really useful. He told me, he told me from his college guy perspective, he told me whenever anyone's making you lie about what you know deep inside to be just and true, before you take it back, all you have to do, as we all know, is cross your fingers <laughs> and put them behind you. As we all know, this magically negates the taking of <laughs> Now, there might be a couple of you here tonight that think this stopped working when you turned 13. No, this works throughout the whole life. <laughs> I swear to God, especially around issues of job, sex, relationship, and term paper due date. <laughs> Across the thing is, all right, Scott, I take it then. Well, he gets off me. It worked. And he kicks me, and he picks up his math book and his banal bonanza lunchbox. <laughs> and then he was off to school and to the rest of his life, which is going to be filled with petty disappointments and five wives. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know that, I just know, all right. I write Facebook, right? <laughs> I pulled those cross fingers from behind my back, those cross fingers negating my taking it back, my triumph over his small tyranny. And I hold those cross fingers up to the sky. I start to repeat those words. They gather steam inside me as I say again and again and again. I will never take it back. I will never take it back. I will never. <laughs>